production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High. Meet Ohio filmmaker Julia Reichert, whose 50 years of work is being showcased this month at the WEX. An Italian glassblower comes to Columbus to demonstrate his talent. We celebrate 50 years of Kappa. And our local music series continues with a performance by the Andy Shaw Band. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Award-winning filmmaker Julia Reichert has spent the past 50 years documenting important social issues, from feminism and communism to labor unions and childhood cancer. Her most recent documentary, American Factory, has received critical acclaim and was released on Netflix this summer. And she's based right here in Yellow Springs, Ohio. Her impressive body of work is being showcased throughout this month at the Wexner Center for the Arts, where we had a chance to talk with her about her career behind the camera. I always say that's kind of what I know how to do, is making films. I don't really know how to do anything else. Well, I'm a good gardener. So I'm a kid from New Jersey, a small town, exit seven of the New Jersey Turnpike. Nobody in our circle ever went to college, but I really wanted to go. Julia's journey from a working class kid, the daughter of a butcher and a nurse in a working class neighborhood in New Jersey, to becoming one of the great documentarians of our time, it's just an incredible journey. You know, when I was a young woman, a young girl, uh, you could either be a teacher, a nurse, or a secretary. Those were basically what you could be. This is pre-women's movement, because I started college in 1964. Growing up female was actually my senior project at Antioch. Every young woman in Terry's high school is required to take a six-week course from her guidance counselor on the subject of marriage. I would say a young wife should be neat and clean and attractive as possible. The husband should make the major decisions. The wife should assist, maybe, if he asks his, her advice. But the major decisions are his. The wife should be uh, at least understanding whatever his decision is. She should go along with it. Also, I believe that a wife should not expect the husband to do any ho housework, like wash dishes, clean the house, uh, do any of this menial task. Growing a female is just before the women's movement hit. Methadone is during the heroin crisis of the 70s, which was largely African-American and working class people. America doesn't have a drug culture. It is a drug culture. And if we want something different, we're going to have to change our society in some fundamental ways. They're more than just old films. They're films that are snapshots of American history and especially Midwest and Ohio history. This beautiful thing about growing up female, but also about so many of Julia's films, is that she evokes real people. She does portraits of real people and lets us grapple with contemporary issues through the lives of actual human beings who we get to know. They told me that they had to be here two years, away from their family, no extra pay. I made it their house, they made it my home. Julia's films really grapple with questions of like, how can people have a decent life if they're not rich, if they're not a billionaire? I'm a working class kid. Did I ever learn labor history in school? Did, did I ever get it from my parents even? I didn't really learn about labor history and the importance of it in shaping our country, but I wanted to know it. Like, I wanted to know my history. All the films 
come directly out of things I wanted to know for my own life, for my own questions that I faced during the different eras of my life. Being in a left-wing movement myself, I was really interested in finding out how people in earlier left-wing movements, how they sustained their beliefs, or did they sustain their beliefs even in the hard times. So we went to people who had joined the American Communist Party. The working class, the capitalist class has nothing in common, nothing. You know, and you'd ponder that. Oh, right, them son of a bitch is up there eating the filet mignon, and we're down here eating burnt liver. I think what makes for great documentaries is real curiosity, where the filmmaker actually cares. Weren't you scared? Weren't you? No. I didn't see anybody around with trench coats and things. A lot of the films I've made explore class, race, and gender. But A Lion in the House is about kids fighting cancer. But as soon as you really go into depth on what that looks like in the lives of five diverse families, Right away, you see racial differences, you see class differences, you know, you see the differences in people who have, are living with economic hardship. In my life, I've always been sheltered by my mother and my stepfather, and this is something that my mother couldn't change or take away from me, so it made me stronger. It made her stronger and me wiser. Mm-hmm. You could do anything when it comes to your child. I really rely on Julia's instincts about people, about story, about which direction to go in. Now, American Factory is, it really tries to be fair to all the points of view that we encountered. The sort of power struggle between China and America has been going on most of the 21st century. It's one of the big stories of the 21st century, right? So that we thought the most valuable thing we could do is let you see what that's like for the Chinese, for the blue collar Americans, for the blue collar Chinese, for the management, and even for the Chinese owner, who's a multi-billionaire. Where you sit today used to be a General Motors plant, and now there are over 1,000 employees working here. Is this a union shop? It is our desire to not be. <laughs> have told, generally speaking, Midwestern stories about Midwestern people. And there aren't very many of us um, doing that. I'm really proud of those movies. And I think they show that we learned it on our own terms. We didn't go to a big film school. We didn't live in the New York and LA community. You know, we weren't shaped by that. We were shaped by the Midwest, by Ohio, and by kind of doing it by our own bootstraps. I think that shows in the movies, and I'm certainly very proud of that. American Factory, the latest documentary by Julia Reichert and Stephen Bognar, is currently playing on Netflix. And this Sunday, you can catch their Emmy award-winning film, A Lion in the House, free at the Wexner Center. The film, which documents five children and their families battling pediatric cancer, plays at one o'clock in the Film and Video Theater. Check out the entire lineup of Julia Reichert, 50 Years in Film, at wexarts.org. Currently on view at Sherry Gallery in the Short North are unique works of glass art made by renowned Italian glass artist Davide Salvadore. He recently came to town to demonstrate his technique, and we were there to check it out. I started to work at the glass when I was uh, 10. It was a consequence because my family, all my family is glass blower. I tried to, to, to make different job, but in, in the end, the glass called me. The glass blower from Rano, when we talk about the glass, we said him, because for us, he's a, um, entity, you know, every day you have a new challenge. Yeah, because the, the glass have a big, big memory. If you make something wrong, hmm, you remember. <laughs> In the end, you can, you can find the, the, the problem 
in the piece. Eh. And I like the challenge. <laughs> What makes Davide Salvadori so special is the technique that he uses in creating his works. They're beautifully patterned. He spends weeks just pulling what they call canes and rods of glass to form what is called marinis that are thousands of pieces of glass all combined together to make beautiful patterns. And then when he blows his actual sculptural piece, He's able to incorporate these Marinis into the work to create the final sculpture. I like this technique, the Murina and the cane, because it's an infinity technique. It's not just uh, take the glass and blow. It's a composition. It's like a pint, the glass. Davide's work is not only technically incredible, but it's the passion that he puts into his work. He was influenced at a young age. At 12, he began making beads, doing lamp work, patterned beads for his mother, who was an artist, and this influenced the rest of his life. He was inspired by the African culture, fabrics, this landscape, sunsets, and the color, and that has influenced his work from ever after that. Even in his musical instrument pieces, you'll still find reference to the beads that he made, you know, beginning at 12 years old for his mother. When I started to work the, the glass, uh, like everybody, I started in the factory. And, uh, and I said, I like to work the glass, but I don't like the factory. And for that, I started very early to open my studio. And, and there, because it's my studio, I can to try a new technique, a new, new vision about the glass. Of course, I use the old Venetian technique, but in, in my way, I have my space in the glass. I can say something with the glass. Yeah, and for that, uh, I love the glass. The current exhibition of Davide Salvadori's work is in the Sherry Gallery in the Short North. I have been representing glass artists for 33 years and very proud to represent Davide because he is one of the best glass blowers in the world. On exhibit are also his son's works. His sons have followed in his footsteps. They are a sixth generation family of glass blowers. Davide is very proud of the son's works as well because they have really, as he says, freed up glass, making it spontaneous and contemporary. I never push my son to work with the glass, to work with me, never. Maybe the, the glass called him like me. Yeah. I think uh, in Murano, we have the blood on the body, but it's, um, I think it's mixed with a little bit glass. <laughs> Davide Salvadori and Matias Salvadori produced a glass blowing demonstration for us yesterday at Glass Axis. We're so fortunate to have Glass Axis allowing artists to work and for all of us to have a treat and to see Maestro Davide Salvadori in action. One of the things that made it really special is this is the third time that Davide has come to Columbus. The first two times he did week-long workshops with the students at CCAD. And now, 10 years later, here they are assisting Davide in the workshop that we saw at Glass Axis. I started many years ago to go around the world for teaching, for show. And now I like that because for me, it's energy, new energy. For example, yesterday I had a, a demo in Glass Axis with a young guy and they helped me. And this is, uh, this for me is new energy. It's, uh, because I feel their passion, you know? And this is wonderful. And for that I go around the world 
everywhere if I can. The stunning glasswork of Davide Salvadore is on view at Sherry Gallery only until October 13th. Learn more at sherrygallery.com. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Columbus Association of the Performing Arts, better known to you as CAPA. The organization formed in 1969 with a single goal, to save the Ohio Theater from demolition. From there, they evolved into a leader of theater rehabilitation, and they now operate, maintain, and promote world-class performance venues here in Central Ohio. We wanted to take a moment to reflect on the group's history and all that they're doing today to contribute to the local art scene. CAPA was formed 50 years ago to save the Ohio Theater from demolition. The Ohio was built in 1928 as a silent movie house. And the question was, why would you tear this down? CAPA came into creation when actually four individuals got together at a time when the theater was about to be torn down and decided the theater was worth saving and it had to be saved. At the time we did that, the building itself had been sold, the organ had been sold, but more importantly, all of the fixtures in the theater, every seat, every chandelier, everything in the theater had been sold to another group of investors who were selling it uh, and the tag sale that they had set up uh, was 10 days from the time the four of us met. In today's dollars, just very roughly, uh, we had uh, to raise uh, $300,000 to buy the option, to buy the property for about $17 million. Uh, we also ended up having to raise about $600,000 in today's dollars to buy all of the fixtures inside the theater back. In order to do that, we had to create an organization that would be a charitable organization, which is CAPA. Uh, so the idea was we would basically convert it into a performing arts center. But they didn't call it the Ohio Theater Association. They always had a bigger plan than that. And that's why they named it the Columbus Association for the Performing Arts. And over these 50 years, we've kind of grown into that name. CAP is a lot of different things. Uh, people tend to have a thought that we're the Broadway series or we're the Ohio Theater, and there's a lot more to that. Uh, the, our buildings are very important to us. We run 10, 10 different performing arts spaces here around Columbus, everything from the Drexel Movie Theater to the McCoy Center up in New Albany to our beautiful historic theaters here, the Ohio, the Palace, and the Southern Theater, as well as managing the Lincoln Theater on the Near East Side. We try to do a little bit of everything so that everybody in our community feels like there's something at one of our venues for them. And that's why right now we're focused on growing our education program. Um, our mission for all of our education and engagement programs is to make sure that everyone in our community has an access to the transformative power of the arts. We think the arts are um, valuable for everyone of all ages. So we really try to service a large, broad area of people. What I like to do is to use whatever programming, wonderful programming that's coming to our buildings, to use that as a springboard or platform to engage our community and to make that programming relevant, um, accessible, and free to the public. So for example, when Hamilton was in town um, last February, we created an engagement project for the community, a spoken word project. And so we took the themes from Hamilton and we challenged the community to come out to a series of workshops where they learned about the art of spoken word poetry. They used Hamilton themes as sort of the lens or vehicle to explore that art form and they came out of it writing their own personal pieces with those themes. My name is Ty E. Sha. Instead, I got Taisha, Tasia, Triisha, or some other version with silent letters. They always hesitated on the first day of class when they got to my name. 
Pie in the Sky goal is to, to reach every single member of the Central Ohio community, to make arts a part of their lives and to provide an outlet and a medium for them to express themselves. Now that's something I think we're really good at and we need to continue to make sure that as the city grows and changes that we adapt with them and provide artists great spaces uh, for shared experiences. Join Kappa on Sunday, October 20th for Spook Out Movie Magic. As part of its year-long 50th anniversary celebration, Kappa will host a daytime screening of Disney's Hocus Pocus at the Ohio Theater. This Halloween-themed event will include intermission entertainment on the Mighty Morton Theater organ and a Hocus Pocus-themed costume contest. Visit kappa.com for details. Our local music series continues this week with a performance by the Andy Shaw Band. Playing together since 2005, this folk rock band from Columbus is a bit of a family affair. Led by Andy Shaw on lead vocals, the group also includes his brother Chris on drums and his dad Jim on keyboard. They brought their sound into the WOSU studio along with their latest single, Ohio. Wretched place and make this path my home as I watch the wind carry off my ways. If I could just let go, oh, I tear down my dying dream. Blind eyes turn.
I'm bound to let it fall apart The pain and all fear that I know Could ever mend this broken heart Could ever mend this broken heart our show, you can find all our stories online at WOSU.org, or you can check out our free WOSU public media mobile app. We're taking you out today with more music by the Andy Shaw Band. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.